It is 7 p.m. I would like to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Chris Brown? Here. Rob Cruz? Present. Amy Grantham? Here. Nancy Hopper? Present. Katie Jess? Here. John Prouty? Here. Melissa Smith? Present. Could you all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You have in front of you the previous minutes from September 18th. What is the pleasure of the board? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Chris Brown? Aye. Rob Cruz? Aye. Amy Grantham? Aye. Nancy Hopper? Aye. Katie Jess? Aye. John Prouty? Aye. Melissa Smith? Aye. You have in front of you the agenda. What is the pleasure of the board? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Chris Brown? Aye. Rob Cruz? Aye. Amy Grantham? Aye. Nancy Hopper? Aye. Katie Jess? Aye. John Prouty? Aye. Melissa Smith? Aye. Next on the agenda, we have an opportunity for anyone in the audience to speak. Any takers? Okay, moving on. Next up, we have reports from our student representative, Anya. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so, October is a really big month for seniors, um, especially because of all of the application stuff. So that's kind of a majority of what I'll be talking about. Um, first, we have a senior graduation meeting tomorrow. So we'll be talking about stuff like cap and gowns, making sure all of our credits are there. Uh, Johnson's will be coming in and kind of talking to us about class rings, all that kind of stuff. Um, Colorado Free Com uh, Application Day is the 17th through the 19th. So um, COSI is coming in to help with applications, scholarships, resumes, and everything else like that for us to prepare. And we're really trying to push getting those applications specifically for Colorado Free Application Day. And then there is a uh, Colorado University in Colorado Springs tour on the 27th of October. So that the really big stuff, uh, specifically regarding college for seniors this month. Um, as far as sports go, volleyball has their pink out night tomorrow. It is our second to last home game. So um, yeah, fall sports are coming to a close super quick. Uh, soccer recently did their car wash um, as a big fundraiser for them. I think it was this past weekend, if I'm right. And their next home game is the 11th. Um, and then winter preseason practices are beginning, and I know boys and girls wrestling has started. They're starting to, you know, get warmed up and all that stuff, as well as basketball, boys and girls. And then um, other than that, the play is still going. I know that they have been working really hard uh, two to three days a week, really getting everything done that they need to. Um, and then just another, like, fun thing to bring up is that our pantry has now extended to both a pantry and a closet. So instead of just food items, there's things like clothes, personal items, laundry detergent, all of that fun stuff for people to take home. So, nice. yeah. Nice. Thank you, Kenya. Next up, we have reports from the board. I know that Mrs. Hopper has a report. I do. Um, first of all, I did not put it in my written report, but I want to make sure I mention it, that Casby is hiring a second attorney. Uh, so we're doing an expansion of the legal team. And we're looking at that in order to support the uh, educational initiatives that are going in, the policy work that we're continuing to work on, and particularly looking at discipline legislation as it's moving forward. So we will have more, more staff attorney time at CASB. Then looking at my report, we did have a CASB Board of Directors meeting the end of September, and so I've just kind of highlighted some of the things. We did have a presentation from the Colorado Secretary of State regarding Proposition HH, and I put that documentation, that PowerPoint, in your packet for you to review and look at. Uh, it's uh, interesting information. CEA and CASE have taken up a position of support on, on that initiative. The bylaws task force that's been in work uh, pretty much all this fall. Uh, delegate assembly will be this weekend. I'll leave Thursday, and the meeting will be Friday and Saturday. And so what we're going to do, and you should all get a copy 
of that bylaws updated information and that will be voted on at the December meeting at Winter Conference, at the Winter Convention. We also had a presentation and I thought it was very interesting. It was from the Colorado Neurodiversity Chamber of Commerce. And this is looking, it was really an excellent presentation. Um, one of the things, and I know it resonates with principals in the room too, uh, we've always uh, alluded to the fact that um, about one out of every four students has some sort of reading disability to some degree. And sometimes that's from uh, whether they've got ADHD or they're autistic or whatever that span may be into different degrees. And so I think it's about, um, so they, they provided this, this is brand new in the state of Colorado. And I, if I remember right, it was pretty much a, a new program that's going through the Chamber of Commerce working with, looking at high school graduates particularly. Can you go back one slide? to the facts. So 20% of the population, one in five, are neurodiverse. And that encompasses, like I said, a lot of those uh, ideas of the autistic, uh, ADHD, some of those other uh, neuro disabilities. 30 to 40% of those adults are unemployed. 85% of the autistic college graduates are unemployed. And so looking at how we can support students. And of course, they were looking at it from a business view of HR, looking at placing kids into colleges and going into the workforce. But I guess as an educator in my background, I, my mind is thinking about how can we help students as they're getting ready to graduate and some of those skills. And it always goes back to those accommodations or 504s or just what does a, a kid need to be successful. And so I found it kind of interesting um, information that they presented and if you want to go to the next one and so they've got a lot of a lot of their work sometimes kids can mask stuff we know that um, of the autistic adults who have a college degree again 85 percent remain unemployed and so just how can we better prepare our students as they're moving into that workforce with some of their disabilities knowing as i said even dyslexia i know the state of colorado doesn't recognize dyslexia as a learning disability in and of itself it's a reading disorder but um, if they're a dyslexic how can we provide supports for them to be successful in the world and so that's really all that one was and i apologize for the next one we can go back to my yeah um, the accountability mindset training with John Tanner that came out as an opportunity for all of us probably about six to eight weeks ago. Um, I think we had about 150 seats available. I signed up and then forgot I signed up. I know that's surprising. And then I got the email about getting everything finished and so that's when I sent an email out to the board. You can still sign up. It's an hour presentation by John Tanner. Uh, and it's recorded so you can go in and watch it anytime on your own. But it was really talking about the accountability of schools and sometimes how um, the inadequacies of how, how accountability measures are. And he gave the, the graph of, uh, I think we've done this ourselves, to you know, a school with 100% graduation rate and a school with 85% graduation rate and which school is uh, the stellar school. And most people would say the one with 100% graduation rate. Well, those kids are coming from a very affluent school. They have all their driving the BMWs to school. They've already got all the supports they need. The kiddos with the 85% graduation rate, probably only 30% of those have those supports coming to that school. And so really looking at that span between those that have and yet getting to that 85% graduation rate, what is that building doing to get that many kids based on some of the factors that are hindering them. And so it was really good. We know that the money follows the schools that really perform, and sometimes the money doesn't follow the schools that are really putting in things to make kids succeed uh, as much as they should be. So that was the accountability um, training, and I think I've got six more hours of that over the next six weeks. Uh, Great Education Colorado Luncheon is Wednesday. I will be attending that as a CASWI representative from uh, rural Colorado. It's at the Botanical Gardens. I've never been, so this is going to be fun for me. Uh, Delegate Assembly, I've already mentioned, is the 6th and 7th in Glenwood Springs. Black Caucus update, as you know, Black Caucus was wanting to have a seat on the Board of Directors for CASBE, not only a seat, but a voting seat, and they have decided that they no longer want to pursue that partnership. And so I think they're looking more of a political line. 
We are, we have a CASB Foundation. We're working to uh, up that again and get more uh, involved with that. Angelica Schroeder is the State Board of Education. She met with us and she indicated that they're moving to change the documentation from free and reduced lunch status to uh, Medicare records because that will encompass more students. So if we're looking at SES status, Medicare would cover that. And so that's a better measure. I was really happy to hear that because I know we don't do free and reduced lunch applications anymore since everybody gets free lunch. Um, State Advisory Council for Parent Involvement. They are looking at a new school view that will be out in December. So those of you that look at that, you should see a new change in that format. Winter convention is in December. The National School Board President, uh, National School Board Association President should be attending our conference. So that'll be fun, get to visit with her. Um, executive Director Evaluation is in process. And just, we're, we're doing an internal analysis of our inter utilization of our CASB services. And we've uh, designated Leslie Bogart as the emergency executive individual. It should something become uh, Dr. Yanni. And we're working on a five-year plan. So that's really, I think, all of my report, unless you have any questions. I can say, thank goodness you're retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else on the board have a report? Okay, next up, Mr. Sanders, Superintendent Reports. Yes, thank you. Um, in my report, you'll see that we have uh, the, the Speak Life uh, Bully Proofing Program. It's a program that is a video that is a, a movie that is a, it's a lot like High School Musical. We, we looked at it as an administrative team and felt like it was uh, going to be something really good for our student body. And so we're looking at, at bringing that program in on, on the 24th of October. Um, it'll, it's good for students in grades four through 12, and we're going to house all the elementary in their buildings and we'll live stream. Uh, we'll have the middle school um, be live, and then the high school they're gonna work out, whether it's gonna be in the classroom or whether they're gonna take them to the gym. Um, but we will have a special guest that day, we're hoping. If it all works out the way it should, I don't know if I really want to say who it is yet. But oh, could it possibly be the person who's up there? Oh yeah, Justin Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Justin Simmons. Wow, from that's from cool. I wasn't watching that. <laughs> I was gonna say surprise. Oh, she's psychic. <laughs> so we actually, um, Brett Miles ran into Justin Simmons and his agent um, over the summer out in San Diego, and, and they started talking about this program, and he's endorsed it. Um, and he feels really passionate about it and he so much so that he uh, said he would love to come out to Fort Morgan and introduce it to our students and in talking we felt like it would be most beneficial to be at the middle school to work with the middle school directly with those students at the, in grades six through eight and then have it beamed in live to the other buildings um, grades four through twelve and so we're kind of excited about that now who knows what's going to happen with the Denver Broncos here in the next little while. And I'm hoping that they win everything and nobody gets traded and nothing happens. But um, And they keep winning, but or, well, start winning more. And so hopefully it works out the way we want it to. Um, right now it appears it's going to. I just have to make the final arrangements with it. So kind of excited about that. Um, on the next one is the Case School State uh, uh, Finance Task Force. I was asked to be on that. Um, we're going to be looking at a lot of issues around um, school finance um, and going to see how Proposition HH kinds of impact schools with tax decrease. How does that work for um, dollars for schools? And we hear it's supposed to be somewhat positive, but um, we want to delve into that a little bit further. But that's a large group of, of people, superintendents, and um, a couple of legislators are going to be on that task force, and I was asked to be a part of that. Um, this week, I leave, if you recall, I was asked to go to the Dominican Republic um, to go work on some service projects and look at their STEM programming. Um, it's on the Education First trip. We leave here shortly, the 4th through the 9th. Um, and while we're there, we're going to do some kind of service project. They haven't told us what it is, but when we were down at um, the National Association of School Boards Convention, the 
video that they showed of the Education First tour and their service project was they actually found a bunch of two or one liter or 20 ounce bottles and two liter bottles and they would rope them together somehow to make walls for rooms and do different things like it, it, I think that one was in the Sudan maybe um, but this one is down in um, the Dominican Republic we'll be visiting three or four different towns um, and it's just really looking forward to the trip and looking forward to the experience and hopefully it opens up more opportunities for our students to take more trips like this so um, and then the last thing is the training on the new lights at the Fort Morgan High School um, we, we haven't got it yet I was hoping we'd have it by now it was supposed to happen last week but um, for some reason the board has been back ordered and there's some things we're waiting on yet so that's my report unless you have anything else any questions for me Safe travels. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be wonderful. Looking forward to it. Okay, next we have Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Assistant, Dr. Good evening. Uh, just a couple updates. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I did not mention this to you before school started. However, we were looking at benchmark data, and we have transitioned from um, we've been part of this early literacy assessment project with the state for quite a while. It's called ELAT. So basically, they pay for our um, DIVLS licenses to utilize to collect our beginning, middle, and end of year data um, for all K to three students. And we transitioned, we've been in DIVLS next. Um, we've transitioned to DIVLS eight. Like any system, they've updated their information. They've actually updated DIVLS eight a few years ago about 2020 and we just hadn't transitioned with the state yet and so um, when I put some data in front of you it is significantly different because in kindergarten um, there, are, there are some additional gated measures in K-3 to and so for example in the beginning of first grade where, where some kids may have never seen oral reading fluency measure before the middle of the year it's now gated so some kids are actually seeing that measure and so what we've seen as K-3 to principals um, and staff members is we've seen a significant increase of kids that are intensive in reading, meaning that we really got to get in there like we have, like we normally do, and close those gaps. And so kids are um, going out and not ending up a bunch of them on read plans by the end of the year. And so just know that they've been working really tirelessly at the elementaries to put them in our 95% intervention groups and really drill down to the gaps that the kids have in early literacy. I think part of it is that we switched assessments, but I think part of it that we've talked about is we're seeing these kids who were pandemic kids in kindergarten missing like half of their kindergarten year, meaning they've missed some of their early literacy skills. And we're now seeing some of those gaps um, some of the gaps are narrowing, but some of them we're just noticing that they're they're still there. <laughs> so um, just know if you want to look at the assessment sometime, I'd be happy to show you. But um, I've asked all of the K to three schools. Dibbles does a nice job of putting a an Excel template basically together to say, okay, we have this many kids well below benchmark, the intensive kids. If we're this percentage at the beginning of the year. It, to make above average progress, where should we be by the end of the year? So I've asked all the buildings to get me that information. I've also calculated that information for the district. So, and then in addition to the well below benchmark kids moving, you want to keep the kids that are benchmark and above benchmark at benchmark or above benchmark. So there's also a growth tool for that as well. Again, looking at well above average progress desegregated by grade, desegregated by building, so we can see and check in a little bit more frequently on how we're closing gaps. And even at the middle of the year, they tell you where you're really supposed to be. So drilling a little bit more into that, that data um, from my level and making sure that, um, because with, with obviously the kids that are significantly reading deficient, we do get funding for them and those funds are directly tied for per pupil allocation for kids who are on read plans. So we definitely want to be seeing a decrease in that. So part of the unified improvement plan for K to three, you're always kind of focusing on how to decrease the percentage of kids who are struggling. As you know, research says, you know, if you're struggling in third grade, then the research says you're struggling <laughs> more than likely. So closing those gaps gets harder as the grade levels go up. So 
So I wanted to get you to know about that. And then in addition on the discussion items tonight, you have the unified improvement plans. I don't know if you, when you came in, there were a bunch of chart papers around or if they were all down. Were they down? So we did a, we did a great work session with the administrative team on, it seems like, it was a long time ago, but it was just last Monday. And so all of the buildings, we really drilled down to what their major improvement strategies were, talked about our own root cause analysis at the district level, um, dug into, um, did some fishbone diagrams, which are cause and effect fish, about what's in our control, about what, what the problem is sort of at the head of the fish, and then what things are causes of our problem and then you have to cross out the things that are not in our control. That is a very difficult thing, and I, I kudos to the principals that are here this evening, but I watched the process at schools, and it is a, doing a good root cause analysis is very difficult because you have to take all the factors out of the reasons that maybe we're not performing, and what can we control, and then you flip over those um, root cause um, you, you flip them from root cause into major improvement strategies and action steps that you can actually, you can control like what the outcome could be. Does that make sense? So I'll put some back up maybe for the next meeting, but they, we did a lot of work um, as admin team and we split people like elementary and secondary to kind of have that diverse conversation about, well, what is happening at the district level as far as the data? Um, what kinds of things are we really wanting to focus on? Because you don't want to have you don't want to have more than three to five major improvement strategies to work on. And so you also so uh, I understand you talked about it in the work session, but we we will not be moving forward with approval for Pioneer High School or the district level. So we have time um, to put together a letter that will be going out. Um, I don't think probably from the district tomorrow and then going forward with doing um, the steps that it takes to get input from parents, people who want to come to a meeting and give their input on the plan that we've already put together so we could tweak it, put little tweaks in there. So just know that those will come before the board. Those are due to the state by January 16th. And that's because they are all, we have the flexibility because they're all year one. Like we're year one as a district in priority improvement, high school's year one in priority improvement, and Pioneer's year one in turnaround. And so we have the ability to um, flex that, that due date. So other than that, we'd be happy to, and principals are here for, for those buildings that you see in front of you if you have questions for them when we come to the discussion items. Oh, one more thing, sorry. Um, it, I met with our social studies curriculum adoption committee. Um, I have people from um, all of our buildings. The one, the one addition I'll be making at the next board meeting, and I apologize, I will not be at that one, but they, we do have um, three parent representatives. I wanna talk the, through the process with them before I put their names in front of you to approve to be on the committee. And what we decided as a social studies uh, certified staff committee is we're going to kind of work in tandem with the parents who have um, who can be on the committee to kind of walk through because we're, we're in the process of getting um, samples of different curriculum to kind of peruse and coming up with some different tools. Um, there are a lot of national tools that you can use when to look at bias in curriculum and so we have a solid social studies um, curriculum adoption team and then family and consumer science I've met with we only have two people on the committee, one from Lincoln, one from the high school. It's just a much smaller, um, much smaller need as far as um, materials there. So, questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Mr. Frasco. Good evening. Um, you guys have the uh, personal action form or action report in front of you. Um, and if there's any questions there, but we're excited to move forward with a um, new athletic director and activities director uh, for the middle school and high school levels um, and take some of that pressure off of our admin staff there. So we're excited for that. Um, hiring's kind of slowed down a little bit, which has been nice. Um, and I uh, haven't had as many leaving or, or having to come on. Uh, as far as openings go, uh, we have uh, still the one certified opening, which is speech language pathology. Um, seven classified positions, five coaching positions. 
Um, so I think as a whole, we're sitting pretty good as a district. Um, and again, it's slowed down, which has been nice because I didn't know if it was going to do that for a while. Um, <laughs> so we have uh, made our first contributions on the HSA HRA uh, out to our folks that qualify for those. Um, we will continue to do that uh, through December as any of those forms uh, come in that are late um, filling those out. Um, but that uh, process has went pretty smooth and the majority of those have already went out. Um, HR audit, um, I had shared last meeting that uh, I put us through a self-imposed um, one. And so we started that last Wednesday with Shelly Landgraf, um, a great process. Um, I spent an entire day with her and we really focused uh, the first stuff and she'll probably be out uh, another time or two to meet with me and just go through things. Um, we really focused on hiring cycle, applications, uh, interview process, documentation, personnel files um, as kind of the, the main focus originally. Um, what I will tell you just for initial assessment was uh, that we dot our I's and cross our T's really well um, and that we're doing things really good and almost too much in some cases. And she's given us some ideas and thoughts to uh, maybe streamline some stuff on our end a little bit that will help out. So we're excited for that, um, but that will continue. Um, we partner with uh, Centura and St. Elizabeth Hospital for flu shots. And so we'll have our first one tomorrow night from uh, 3.45 to 5.15. Uh, we'll have a second one on the 18th of October, and if there's need um, showing up, we'll do a third one uh, to be scheduled later. So nice to be able to offer that for our staff and their families. And then the last one is uh, I just attended the CASPA conference uh, this past uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, just very informational, great networking. Um, learned a lot more on the Power Act, which is really big right now, um, around documentation, and there's still a lot of questions across the state of how we how we handle that from from our end of the world um but uh um, learned a lot more on that and more to learn mm -hmm. so great experience uh, going up and, and being part of that so thank you what does caspa stand yeah. for oh colorado association of school personnel association personnel nice test <laughs> <laughs> So I gotta say in my nearly eight years on the board, I'm fairly sure that's the smallest personnel report I've seen. So good job. Yes. Very nice. Yes. And that's because of the buildings. It's not because of me. Our good buildings job. are working really hard to, to meet the needs of our staff. Good for them. Okay, next up, our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Miller. Well, um, our department is continuing to work on audits. I don't really have a formal report for you because we just pretty much focus on those. And I didn't want to just come up with something to say so that you could hear me talk. So if you have any questions, I would glad to answer them. Just working on finance stuff. We're very, very happy with our department. We, I mentioned last time we had filled the last position and she's a very good fit. All of the personalities are working very well together, so I'm really excited. Okay, next up we have discussion items. First up is the unified improvement plans. Um, we are going to be voting tonight on all but the District 1 and Pioneers. Um, but right, it's, yeah, it's not listed on there. So, and yes, the high school as well. So um, any discussion about that? Want to add anything? Well, you should question the principals as long as they're here. Now, I, again, I just want to reiterate how much, I mean, they, they've really done a nice job of, they're very different, and they should be different UIPs, and so they've worked with their staff and, and figured out kind of where their, where their goals are, and again, they've, they've run really good processes to make sure that their staff's um, voices were heard. I'd like to ask a question if I may. When I was reading Sherman's, no, I was reading Sherman's. Uh, it, it referred to truancy as the issue, which I totally understand and get. But I thought we had a truancy committee in, and can you tell me what the status of that, is that still an active committee? Did that come up with some uh, ideas and close? Yes, it actually is, and we're supposed to meet tomorrow, but nobody has sent me any students that, or families that need to be addressed by the committee yet. Um, we do have a committee of, um, there's two retired teachers, two or three retired teachers. There's a retired judge. There's people from DHS, people from the family center. Um, just 
a large group of people that are going to volunteer their time one Tuesday a month to come in here and hear um, why their kids are why why they're not getting their kids to school or why the kid is not coming to school, and then to tie them to certain resources in the community that are already existing to help that family to try and get that student into school. That is an intermediate step before they actually go to court. So right now. I asked last week if we had anybody, or at the beginning of this week, I can't remember which, um, if we had anybody going in front of the committee yet, and we do not. It will pick up. We will have, as, as time goes on, it's just early in, in, the, in the year yet. So okay. it, looking forward to that process. Okay. And then one other question, if I may. Do, do we all, all buildings have the PBIS model in play? And, we, and have had for a number of years, correct? Okay, thank you. So a question I have, like, a lot of the unified plans refer to gaps in fidelity to curriculum or to instruction or mm -hmm. what, what's, what, what's the cause? Why, why do we have a gap in fidelity? I mean, why, why do we have pretty good fidelity to our curriculum and to our instruction and to all of that type of stuff? Yeah. Gaps in instruct fidelity that would lead to being able to be implied from Great question. And um, teachers, uh, first and foremost, I think they do the best that they can. But when we are implementing research based curriculums and people decide to choose on taking certain things out, I'll give you an example. So, in our, we just are transitioning at the elementary from Envision was really new last year. Um, CKLA is brand new for a lot of teachers and so we've asked them to really specifically we've given them pacing sort of guides to make sure that um, yes you have to kind of stay in line with the way that this curriculum was designed because what happens is if if one or two teachers does not they don't finish a year's curriculum in a year's time meaning they're not hitting all of the standards because in my head, I always use curriculum equals standards. A lot of people use curriculum equals the program we're using. But really, all of the curriculums we're utilizing are aligned to the standards. And so if, if a person or a team of people just decide and you don't have the accountability at the leadership level that puts those things in place, those are how the, and they, some of them might be tiny little gaps. But tiny gaps create bigger gaps year over year if you're saying, well, I didn't hit this skill in the first grade. It spirals, most of our curriculum spiral right back around. And so if you have not closed some, some of the foundational gaps, it just creates gaps later on. And so I think gaps can mean a few things. Gaps in fidelity and then creating additional gaps when you're, when you're spiraling back around that you haven't totally um, hit those standards by grade level. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I think in addition to that is um, not only just fidelity to curriculum, but then also fidelity to kind of the interventions. So I know that I was looking at the board, what you worked on, and MTSS implementation across the board is systematically looking at systems of support for all kids, really. I think actually every kid probably have an MTSS because even if you're at the higher achievement or higher growth level, there are still things that we can be working on in like a what I need time or I mean, some of the, our buildings call it differentiation time. And so how you're taking a kid from where they're at and then pushing them, you know, to make, to make as much growth as they can. And so we did identify at the district level that we have seen over the, and because of whatever teacher turnover has something to do with it, and you're coaching these teachers up on the new curriculum. But then again, I think it comes back to us as leaders being um, making sure people are accountable and giving them feedback when, if they're not having fidelity to the curriculum, that we make sure that that's the first thing that kind of gets um, closed. And I guess I have a follow-up question then to the principal center here is, how are you ensuring that fidelity is taking place? because it sounds like we're getting curriculum that's evidence-based and teachers are then modifying that curriculum to what they think it should be rather than following the curriculum that's been presented to them. So when we talk about accountability, 
um, what is the accountability that is that you are envisioning um, if you have a, a teacher that's not following the uh, educational plan of that evidence-based uh, program? Over us, we work in like contact pairs, so we're two teaching faces set, right? So we prepare curriculum maps and then now out our curriculum about how the course of the year. And then we're working with that. Back. And then so that back ties is more work from um, and our partnership working together and keeps us on track on that. Um, and so that's one way that we do. And then like option. When, when they mentioned the observations, um, I just, and Rob can take it too, but I, I want you to, we're doing something called Observe for Success, and we are super, I, I'm going to speak for me, but I, I think we all talked about it as a district level admin team, that we're super excited because I'm partnered with Galen currently, Shelly's partnered with Jaylen, and Rob and Jason are partnered, and we schedule time in each building for a couple hours, and the principal um, walks alongside us and we go into classrooms and we're not their evaluators but we all are using the same observation tool and so the the awesome thing is we can walk out of a classroom and say what did you see what did you see and a lot of times it's three different things but we we've started as a district level team looking for posted learning objectives to see if their learning objectives are aligned with the lesson and then really working with principals on so what is that teacher going to get feedback on? We leave a note to each classroom teacher, and really it's for just a, an affirmation more than anything else. And then the principal can share the observation form with them. And I think that ties really nice in with fidelity because I, I will know sort of where people are supposed to be. The principal knows where people are supposed to be as far as their curriculum maps or the pacing guide goes. And then it could lead into that conversation. And so I think for, for me at least, it's, that is refreshing to be in the classrooms and saying, okay, this is really going well, or we've got a little hiccup in the implementation, and then on my level, it's, do we need to get more training? Do we need to have more job embedded, um, like more coaching in this classroom, or what can we do as a district team to, do we do, need to do a whole training on something? And so that has been, that's been really great, starting in September. I'm going to add that part of this is uh, when we started talking goals from the board level and we started talking about some of those things and I thought, well, we need to start making plans on what we're going to do about this fidelity thing. And um, we started last summer with balanced leadership and one of the, a lot of the things come right down to um, strategies that we can do that are tied to effect sizes. And one of the effects, the largest effect sizes, the biggest bang for the buck, if you will, is, is a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And what that means is that you as an administration or as a district level um, team have to do your best with your principals to make sure 
that you're reducing the variability of what the experiences kids get from room to room, and now that from the district perspective, from building to building. And so then throw that one more step, is if we're trying to reduce that variability in curriculum from building to building, we're also trying to reduce that variability in how we observe. The conversations that we have out, out in the hallway are very valuable on our learning um, as, as we learn about each other, how we evaluate and how we move forward. We've had some of our new principals say that, or assistant principals say this has been a really great experience for them because they, you know, coming into the job, not sure, sure exactly how to do an evaluation. It's been really handy for, for uh, them to hear words and hear um, the different observations that we make. So we're really making an effort with that. And if I can piggyback on uh, Rob and um, that guy over there, John, question. <laughs> you know, the, the fidelity that, you know, we, we adopt curriculums that are aligned and it behooves us to follow those curriculums, otherwise we do create those Swiss cheese kids. And so I think that is, ex that, that's what I used to call them. Um, so we, we've got to follow those curriculums to make sure that there's not those holes because those holes just get bigger. So thanks. So one last question that I have, how often are observations done? Yes. <laughs> but so as an example for the observations that were just done for a specific group of teachers. When are they scheduled the cycle. to be observed again? What's the cycle of it? And our district level process is helping with that because I, like, I think we were calling by Jason and I beginning of them last month, and we're due to be there again tomorrow. And so um, we're starting to cycle back through the building. I don't think I've been to the middle school yet, but we need to we need to hit there. I think I missed that day. Yeah. So yeah, we're really getting around, getting out and in the buildings. And we've stepped up a little bit from a from a brand or evaluation st uh, standpoint um, for teacher evaluation. Um, non or certain, I'm sorry, um, non probationary teachers, teachers three years or more, they're only required two observations throughout the year as part of their evaluation cycle. Probationary teachers are required four. But to observe for success, we've said we're going to do at least four on every uh, individual. And then um, those that maybe are struggling. We'll get it more. So. Okay. Thank you. Any more discussion? Okay, moving on to discussion item B. We have policies. We are on the third reading. First reading occurred August 21st, 2023. The second reading occurred September 18th, 2023. The third reading is tonight, October 2nd, 2023. The policies that we are voting to adopt tonight, um, either with the wording as already um, written, um, with the changes recommended by CASB or the new policies coming in recommended by CASB, are policies A, C, B, C, B, C, dash R, C, B, F, GBAA, GBEB, IC, ICA, IHBIB, JBB, JK, JKA, JKD slash JKE, JKD slash JKE dash R, KDB dash R. The policies that we are rescinding are policies BDFC, policy GBGG. Now the two policies that are listed under there, LBD, LBD-R, were policies that we adopted April 17th, 2023. CASB decided that we needed to have some changes. And since we already had two readings, when CASB decided that they were just kidding 
and they didn't want those changes quite yet, you will vote on them again in January of 25. So um, those, we are rescinding those recommended changes that have already been through two readings. Any discussion about that? All right, moving on to the consent agenda. You have before you the personnel action report. What is the pleasure of the board? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Chris Brown? Aye. Rob Cruz? Aye. Amy Grantham? Aye. Nancy Hopper? Aye. Katie Jess? Aye. John Prouty? Aye. Melissa Smith? Aye. Moving on to action items. Action item A, we have the unified improvement plans. What is the pleasure of the board? I move we approve the unified improvement plans presented with the exception of Pioneer and the district plans. We'll table those. Um, uh, the high school's already delayed. Second. Thank you. <laughs> second. We have a motion. Uh, I think Nancy already did, the thanks, John. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I think we had a great discussion on the UIPs tonight. Mm -hmm. Roll call, please. Chris Brown? Aye. Rob Carruth? Aye. Amy Grantham? Aye. Nancy Hopper? Aye. Katie Jess? Aye. John Prouty? Aye. Melissa Smith? Aye. Action item B, policies on third reading. You have in front of you policy AC, BC, BC-R, CBF, GBAA, GBEB, IC, ICA, IH, BIB, JBB, JK, JKA, JKD slash JKE, JKD slash JKE-R, KDB-R, and rescinding Policy BDFC and GBGG, rescinding recommended changes per CASB to LBD and LBD-R. What is the pleasure of the board? Move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Chris Brown? Aye. Rob Cruz? Aye. Amy Grantham? Aye. Nancy Hopper? Aye. Katie Jess? Aye. John Prouty? Aye. Melissa Smith? Aye. And then we have one of my favorite parts, the newsletters. We have Baker's and Columbine's newsletters. Advanced planning. The next Board of Education meeting is October 16th, 2023. And we do have the um, meeting before that, work session before that at 6 p.m. We also have the board member, what do you call it? Boot camp. I Boot camp. Um, I don't have that date. So if you, if any of the current board would like to attend that, you need to let Bev or Rob know so that we can post that as a meeting. And that one will be on school accreditation. School accreditation? Or is that finance? One of the last two are accreditation and school finance, so it could be. Okay, either one of those. I'm sorry, Monday, October 23rd. The 23rd, October And it's on district accountability and readings. Gotcha. That's it. There it is. Thank you. All right, and if there's no further business before the board, we are adjourned at 7.49 p.m.